turn to the, to the book of Matthew, chapter 28, and I've asked Duane to come up and read uh, Matthew, chapter 28. Thank you, Pastor Dan, for this immense, pri immense privilege of reading uh, page 706 in the Pew Hymnals, if you'd like to follow along. After the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. They will see me. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders, they devised a plan. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to, to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went into Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Thank you, Wayne. Last few days, I, can I have my mic turned down a little bit? Last few days I've been uh, really uh, praying for other churches in our community and just thinking about uh, the Easter celebrations that are going on all over uh, Janesville and in Rock County today. And, and not only that, but thinking about all the worldwide. This is just a small, small part of what God is doing worldwide. Today there's millions and millions and tens and hundreds of millions of people uh, celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Because all over the world, we know we're broken. We know we're messed up. We struggle with being judgmental and self-righteous and, and full of lust and greed. And, and we've got the wrong agendas. And we, we, go, we all know inside that, I mean, in a very profound sense, we're, we're messed up. We're broken people. And Jesus said, I'm going to take responsibility for your brokenness, for your sin. All the things you've ever said that were wrong, all the things that you've ever thought that were wrong, all the, all the things that, that we've done to one another, to hurt one another, Jesus took responsibility for all of it on the cross. That was Good Friday. We talked about that last week. And then Resurrection Sunday, Christ did not stay in the grave. He rose again. He rose again with incredible power. This is something that doesn't happen every day. I mean, if you've ever lost a, a relative or, or even a, a pet, or even an aunt, you know, or whatever. They, they don't come back. But Jesus Christ came back from the dead. Here's, here's what's, what happened here. Jesus said, I love you. I love you. And we didn't have the time of day for him. We rejected him. We, we hammered him to a cross. Put him in a tomb. His love, 
His love that brought him down from heaven was so strong. This is a love that not even death could stop. This is, this is a love that all the sin of man, all, all, that, that death itself piled on top of it, and he burst forth, come back to life, because love, uh, death can't stop this love. God cares about you. He took care of your sin. It's finished. It's dealt with. The wrath of God was poured out on the cross. There's no more wrath left. Jesus took care of it all. And he rose again in brothers and sisters all over the world, all over the world. In every culture, in every language, in every single country on the planet, there are people today gathered together to say thank you, to remember love is real, God is real, our sin is real, God did something about it. And last week I, I, I played this song that had, there was a line in there that if there wasn't any God, it's like we're dressed, all dressed up with, and there was never any place to go. Well, there is some place to go. We're not dreaming for eternity and it's not there. We're not wondering if there's truth and purpose and meaning and justice. It's there. God is there. And God's provided us a way to get right with him. That's what Easter is all about. And I was playing some worship music just in different languages because I love to, to see people in different cultures and different languages and, and using their own cultural types of, of music to worship God and to praise God because... I think heaven's going to be like that. But uh, there was this church in uh, China, China's largest church in, in Liaoxi. The church seats about 5,000 people. It has a cross on a tower that's 206 foot in the air. At night, the whole building is outlined in blue. Now, you can consider this gaudy or not. It's outlined, this building that's like 12 stories tall, is outlined in blue neon lights as a beacon to their entire community. Here's the church, and shining over the whole community is this cross. That region, that entire region is called the Jerusalem of the East because of its high concentration of Christians. Persecution is rising in China. It's kind of, the, the Communist Party has kind of a love-hate relationship with Christianity. They actually, uh, printing Bibles, they took a look at the West after trying to hammer down the church really hard underneath Mao. They took a look at the West and said, wow, the West had cultural, their underpinning was Christianity, and look how successful they were. They were. So they kind of loosened up on Christianity, the government actually building churches, whatnot like that. Uh, and Christianity has just boomed. As their economy has gone up, uh, Christianity has gone up uh, parallel to that. And now they're starting to get a little scared because Christianity is growing so quickly in China, it's estimated that there's already more Christians in China than in the United States. And within the next 10 to 30 years, there's going to be more public churches than there are in the United States. That doesn't even count the house churches. Christianity is exploding there. So this entire region is called the Jerusalem of the East. Uh, some cities, uh, uh, large cities, over a million people have Christian mayors, Christian heads of police. Uh, uh, Christianity is just really booming in this area. And these Christians have a passion to reach the Middle East and go places where American Christians are automatically going to be discredited. They feel like they can bring the gospel into places where people won't want to hear it from an American missionary. Uh, even as persecution has been intensifying, the Chinese church has been continuing to grow rapidly. China, South Korea, where they just had that incredibly sad tragedy uh, with the ferry boat sinking. Uh, South Korea is, is about 40% Christian, Seoul maybe 50% Christian. That all happened in like 50, 60 years, this explosion of Christianity uh, all over Central and South America. We think of, of Christianity as a Western religion, Europe and the United States, but really it's the, it's the Southern Hemisphere now and it's the uh, other place in the world where Christianity is really rapidly growing. And you, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, listen, if you, are, if you love Jesus, if you said, yeah, I'm going to follow him, this is my life, this is where I'm going to plant my flag, this is where I'm going to build my house on the foundation of Jesus, you have millions and millions and millions of sisters and brothers. And you'll know every single one of their names because eternity is a long time. A lot of them are going to be difficult because they're Chinese. <laughs> I, think, I think we'll uh, be able to deal with it in, uh, in eternity. Isn't it a wonderful, wonderful thing to think how Jesus Christ died and rose again 2,000 years ago? This message just exploded on the world. Uh, and today, all over the globe, there are people just like us. Uh, 
coming to church, bringing their struggles with them, and celebrating the goodness of God together. <clears throat> Today's message is going to be kind of short. I just wanted to focus on <clears throat> the death and resurrection of Christ and, and what does it matter? Because Christ died for our sins, he rose again, but we're very capable. Human beings have an amazing ability to stand uh, when we should be standing in awe and we, we can yawn. That sky out there is absolutely gorgeous. Now, a lot of planets in our, in our solar system, you would not be able to see the stars at nighttime. The, it, it's all gas, it's all clouds, it's, all, it's always covered. We, we're able to look up and see a beautiful blue sky during the day and at nighttime, this black velvet covered with diamonds and then a moon. Uh, we should be in awe of the beauty of creation all the time. Uh, think about the trees and in, in, in the sap moving up and down, the way the leaves are starting to come in the spring. Think about how the grass gets green when the rain comes. Think about the beauty and, and awe and wonder of the, of the human mind. We said there's more neural connections in your brain than there are stars in the universe. And remember, there's approximately a trillion universes, a hundred trillion universes with a hundred trillion stars. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just incredible, ridiculous. We're surrounded by glory all the time, but we have a great capacity to be able to treat it like it's a whole home. Uh, the death and resurrection of Christ. What, what does it matter? So we're just going to look real quickly at a few Bible verses. If you have your scriptures, turn them to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> This is the Apostle Paul writing, remember, he's the fella that uh, originally was persecuting Christians. He voted to have uh, Stephen killed, uh, ki held the jackets of people. He, he was going house to house, tearing apart families, really uh, working hard to stamp out Christianity. And on his way to Damascus, he met the resurrected Jesus Christ. That changed his perspective a little bit. And now uh, he's suffering himself. He's going everywhere telling about Jesus Christ. Uh, suffering for this, and now uh, this is one of the texts that he wrote. He writes, by the way, we're, we're going through a book called Loving God by Chuck Colson in, uh, in the adult Sunday school class, and it tied right into Easter really well this morning, uh, if you were there for that. But Colson was part of the Watergate thing, you know, the Watergate conspiracy, and he said, we weren't able to keep the conspiracy quiet uh, for two weeks, and nobody was threatening in our life. Uh, we, uh, we sold out to get a better deal. He said, make that contrast with the apostles who all except one died for their faith. The original Christians who had seen the resurrected Jesus Christ went everywhere. They lost their businesses. They lost their homes. Many of them were put to death. And they did not deny that Jesus Christ rose again when they had everything to lose. Uh, scandal, uh, the Watergate scandal fell apart because people were selling each other out, didn't want didn't to suffer because they knew their deceit had been involved. Nobody was willing to die for Jesus if it had all been a scam or a deceit from the beginning. But hundreds of people went everywhere to preach this truth that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. God loves you. Your sin can be forgiven. He dealt with that on the cross. And you too can have eternal life if you put your faith in him. So this is that Paul who's writing, who met the resurrected Jesus Christ. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Uh, in Christ's death, we symbolically died with him. Our old life died with him. Our sin was placed on him. It was crucified at the, on the cross. He died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. Did you get that? If you're here this morning you consider yourself a Christ follower, you no longer live for yourself. He died so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Otherwise, you'd become a Christian and be like, beat me up, Scotty. You'd just go right, right up to heaven. We're here for a purpose and a reason. That's to serve Jesus Christ. We live for a higher purpose now. 
We live no longer for ourselves. And you're thinking, yeah, sometimes I kind of do. Yeah, right, that's right. It, it's wrong. It's right that we're wrong. <laughs> we do often uh, live as if, as if the most important thing is the water bill. We live as if the most important thing is where I'm going to live or what job I'm going to have. When our purpose, the reason we're here, is to represent Jesus Christ here on earth. When we surrendered to Christ, we're supposed to be, actually, this is the truth. When we surrender, we're controlled by Jesus Christ's love. And the, and the, the purpose of my life is no longer to, to make Dan Wolf look good. The purpose of my life is no longer to be up here and look down on other people. The purpose of my life is to be like Christ. Christians are little Christ. He sacrificed himself in order to love people close to heaven. Brother and sister, your purpose is to love people and bring them close to Jesus. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, your purpose is to love people closer to God, to, to, shine, to, to share and shine out this gospel that there is a God, that human beings are broken, we're all sinners, nobody's going to walk into heaven strutting or on a high horse we need to get on our knees before the living god say thank you for the cross thank you for your love i'm going to take that i'm going to take that because i don't find hope in the world and i don't find hope in my own heart what i find in my own heart is nasty what i find in his heart is good and beautiful because our purpose is tied to god and his purpose it means that life in christ just doesn't give us the experience of purpose. Because there's a lot of people that say, I have purpose. It's to read comic books. Or, or I, I have purpose. It's, it's to make sure there's art in every library across the United States. Or, or I have, you know, good things. I have purpose. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's to play football. Or my job is to, to run or catch. Or people have, have these. But it's actually just the experience of purpose. But it, it doesn't have importance in eternity and this is easy to figure out it's easy to think of think about people in the roman empire okay whatever they chose whether they were going to steal from their neighbor whether they were going to honor their marriage or not it doesn't matter to anybody today that purpose ended with their era with their locality if you want a purpose that transcends geography that transcends the chronology of where when and where you're born that purpose has to be connected with God. And in Jesus Christ, when he, when he calls us to come to him, uh, Dwayne just read that he gave us this mission, this great mission to go out to the, all world, to the entire world, call people to obey everything that Jesus Christ has taught. Now our purpose, our mission, is not just experiential, it's actual. It transcends because it's tied to the transcendent God. This purpose does, doesn't disappear when we or our, our die or our culture fades away. This is the purpose that echoes in eternity. It really has meaning. Now let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, from verse 17. So skip down a little bit. 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old way, not working out. The old way is a dead end, and, and you know it. Everyone knows it. Turn to Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, all these things are from God. Not, I don't produce them from my flesh. The, the day I was saved, the day I was saved, I became a child of God. But I still have this duality within me, the part that, that God is shaping and molding to be more like Christ, and this fallenness within me. And guess what? Forty-some years later, the fallen part of me is not better. Now, it can polish itself up. It can look better, but it's still fallen. And Christ doesn't say polish it up. We're supposed to crucify our sinful nature. The sinful nature doesn't get acceptable over time. The sinful nature is always, always excluded. That's why we need this new nature from God. Now, all these things are from God because they can't be generated from the flesh who reconciled us, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
It's this idea of reconciliation as two warring parties. Now, God is the one who was wronged by us. We weren't wronged by God. So God is the one who can offer forgiveness. And Jesus Christ came to offer reconciliation. Let's get this relationship back together, which was lost by Adam and Eve, you know, at the fall. Let's get this reconciliation together. And then if you are a Christian, you have a purpose in life that's to be part of this process of of reconciliation. We're supposed to bring the gospel to people so that they can repent, get right, get forgiven, and become part of God's kingdom, which is growing daily. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. This is a purpose and a meaning that transcends what color car I'm going to have or what color I'm going to paint my bedroom or whatnot. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. This is why the gospel is called the good news. The things that we're not aware of. That's a sin that we, we have made so many excuses for that we're comfortable. That we're not aware of sin. Christ died for that and he's not counting against you. The sin that you've forgotten the way you treated somebody, but guess what? They still remember because they were hurt. Christ took responsibility for that too. The secret sins that you are aware of and you don't want anybody else to know about. Jesus Christ, if you put your faith, faith in him, he's not counting your trespasses anymore. That's good news because either I stand before God forgiven or I stand before God trying to excuse all the nastiness and excuses don't fly before the throne of God. There's only two possibilities. I'm going to stand up there and say, yeah, but, 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 as if I could before the living and awesome God. Or I'm going to say, thank you, God. I know I need a Savior and thank you for being my Savior. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You notice the theme here? Boom, boom, boom. You have a purpose. You have a meeting. We have the word of reconciliation. Now let's go out and start sharing. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Paul knows we're slow. The Holy Spirit knows. Did you hear that with the mic? The Holy Spirit knows that we're slow. The purpose of your life is to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Represent wherever you go. Wherever you go, make Christ attractive. Wherever you go, make the things of God beautiful. Wherever you go, draw people closer to Jesus. Look for those opportunities. Pray for opportunities to share the love of God with other people. People need to know not only that God is real, but that he really, really, really loves them. No one has to go to hell. Can we be clear on that? Because of what Jesus did on the cross, nobody has to go to hell. The doors of heaven are open. They're not closed. Where is the barrier found? It's between our ears. It's in our hearts. We slam those doors closed and say, I don't want anything to do with God. or, Or we say, yeah, I believe in God, but I'm too busy and I really just don't care. And God is saying, go be an ambassador. Go win people. Go, go grab their hand. Let's, let's run together. Let's, let's live this life the way it's supposed to be, and let's start drawing people closer to God into this relation, into this reconciliation that he's offering. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Now listen to this. As though God himself were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Sometimes people say, uh, people who are going to be saved are going to be saved. I'm not going to appeal. I'm not going to beg. Listen, that's not the way the Apostle Paul operated. That's not the way the Holy Spirit operates. Through us as ambassadors, we're making this appeal, even if it makes us look foolish, because your soul is more important than my comfort. And I'm going to look foolish, if that's what it takes, to try to win somebody, to win somebody's soul, to snatch somebody out of the fires of hell and into a loving relationship with God. We are ambassadors of God, God himself making an appeal through you. You want your life to matter? Let God make an appeal through you to somebody else. Tell me one thing that would be a bigger deal than that. We beg you on behalf of Christ, get right with God because you don't have to be wrong with God. Get right with God. He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, our substitute so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Did you get that? 
Because of the cross and Christ's resurrection, when we put our faith in him and belong to him, everything changes. Everything changes. You know, you've heard this before. If you go play on the highway and you get hit by a, a Mack truck, things change. You don't go away from that unaffected because the truck is big. God is bigger than the truck. You don't get close to God and walk away unaffected. Things change. When we put our faith in him and belong to him, everything changes. The old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. A new mentality, a new way of dealing with life, a new way of thinking about life, a new purpose in life. God wants to reconcile the world to him, and you get to be part of it. You get to be part of it. Oh, I have to go out and tell people about Jesus. You don't get it. You get to be part of God-loving people. That's a wonder. That's a joy. We are ambassadors. Think about that. Oh, you mean the pastor's an ambassador? Oh, you mean the worship team's an ambassador? No. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I mean you are an ambassador. We are ambassadors. Because of Christ's work on the cross, listen, you have the righteousness of God. Oh, nobody loves me. I'm, I'm worthless. Tell that to Jesus. Tell that to God who thought you were worth his blood. The de God thought you were worth this suffering. God, God, in God's mind, you were worth this suffering and this death. I'm, I'm messed up. I'm wicked. Nobody knows what's, what's going on on the inside. God, can, God can't stand me. He looks at me and he, he wants to know. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God looks down and he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's no longer your righteousness. It's a righteousness that comes by faith. It's a righteousness given by God. Nobody can stand before God and look at me. I'm right. That's called self-righteousness, and it's not going to work. God can see. You know, you can run, but you can't hide. God can see. God knows. And that's why I need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Brothers, sisters, friends, have you accepted this great sacrifice? Have you said thank you for what Christ did for you on the cross? And have you put your faith in, in, in what Christ did when he rose from the grave? He, he, this is a stamp on history. This is a stamp saying, I can keep my promises. I rose from the grave, and when I promise you eternal life, I can give that. Because of Christ's work on the cross, you can have the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to you. Let's turn to the Gospel of John now, John chapter 11. You can read the story of Lazarus. John chapter 11 from verse 1 there. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary, it was the same Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love, Lazarus, our brother, he's sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, the sickness is not going to end in death, but for the glory of God. So the Son of God may be glorified. He's going to prove himself. He's going to give evidence of who he is. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are, you not, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that, they may awaken him, so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he's going to recover. He's going to wake up. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they had thought he was speaking of a literal sleep. So Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And 
I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. Let's go to him. He knows that he knows that they need more convincing. Therefore, Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, okay, let's go so that we can die with him. Real vote of confidence there. So when Jesus came, he found that they had already, he had already, Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. I hate death. I hate death. I'm glad God hated enough to do something about it. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he's going to rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Uh, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And you can see with verse 25 there, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. You can tell that he's kind of just like a, a, a good teacher, like a really good math teacher or a history teacher. Um, that's what people say. Maybe Jesus was just a good teacher. A good guy doesn't say, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And then verse 26, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. And then, of course, we all know what happens next. Uh, Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Uh, and he does. He obeys because Jesus is the king, and he gets to command what he will. You think following a king who has authority over death matters? Does the, does the resurrection of Christ matter? Does the fact that he can raise people from the dead, does that matter? Mom, Mom and Dad and I, we lost a good friend this week. Uh, I grew up in the church where he was. We loved him and his family. I remember in college when, when the, their marriage didn't work out and there was a divorce, I was, a co I was in college away from home, and I started crying because I love these people. He was our neighbor when we were living in Milton. Uh, stop, we'd stop in, talk, loved to see him. He was always he's a strong man and always uh, liked to see him carrying rocks and working outside. Recently, this last winter, I drove by his house numerous times knowing he was sick, uh, but I had other things to do in Milton. Each time I thought, I'm going to stop in there, I'm going to talk to him, and I didn't. Well, I will, because this man was a believer in Jesus Christ. I, I regret that I missed my opportunity. I really regret that. But I, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, this world is not the end. There's a beauty and a strength and a power that transcends this fallen, messed up, tear-filled world that reeks of death. I lost a good friend, but only for a time. I'm going to see him again, and I know this, and I will celebrate eternity with him and with every single other believer who has gone before. 1 Thessalonians, please turn there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Death and resurrection of Jesus Christ matters. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, please turn your Bible from verse 13. We were talking this week in one of our uh, Bible studies, one of our neighborhoods, I think that's on Thursday, how, how everything in creation, everything in this world, we have, we have desires. I'm, I'm hungry, and there's food for that. And, and I'm thirsty, there's water for that. And, and there's sexual desire, and there's a way to satisfy that. And in clothing, and there's a way to satisfy And shelter, and there's ways. Uh, there, there are, for every desire, there's ways, but we desire justice. We desire truth. We desire to be forgiven. We desire eternal life. And, and we're supposed to be told that we're just dressed up and there's never any place to go. These are the things that I desire. These are the things that I, was, that I, that I feel like is made. And if there's no God, it's some cruel hoax of evolution. Somehow evolution designed us so that we're going to have all these wants and needs and there's no, no fulfillment for them. Well, I don't believe that. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Gratitude. Everybody on the planet wants to be able to be grat say thank you, thank you. Thank you for the beauty. Thank you for nature. Thank you for this food. And if there's no God, you ever realize that you can't say thank you to anybody? Well, I can have feelings of gratitude towards the Mother Earth. Well, you know, she's not hearing you. It, there's feelings of gratitude, desire, a desire to be forgiven, all these things. If there is no God, it's, they're all a dead end. We're dressed up without any place to go. That's a really bizarre consequence of evolution. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, this is the last section we're going to look at today, and then we're going to close with a, we're going to just sit and listen to a classic Christian song. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. Again, Apostle Paul writing, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. We don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep. Here it means death. Here's the church. What happens when people die? That's sad, right? It's devastating. I hate death. Well, God hates death, too. That's why Jesus did something about it. We don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as the rest of the world who have no hope. <clears throat> a couple things here. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to grieve. You're going to miss that person. You're not with that person. <clears throat> but the despair, the absolute despair where you feel it's over, it's final, I'm never going to see that person again. Paul, who met the resurrected Jesus Christ, who had been putting Christians to death, met Jesus, changed his life, was suffered, he was beaten, he, he was shipwrecked, he had rocks thrown on him until he thought he was dead, and eventually he was killed for his faith in Jesus. The Paul, whose life changed because of the resurrected Jesus Christ, is saying, when people die, when fellow Christians die, don't grieve like the world grieves without hope, because you have hope. See how that matters? This matters. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have died in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, we're saying this by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive will remain until the coming of the Lord, that we who are, who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, even if you're alive when Christ comes again, because the Bible promises Christ is coming again, even if you're alive then, you're not going to go before. All the people who have died in Christ before you are going to raise and, and come with Jesus. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The knowledge that Jesus Christ died, he rose again, and the promise that he's coming back, comfort one another with these words. These words should be a comfort daily. These words need to be a comfort at funerals. These words need to be a comfort when we're thinking about the vast beyond. Jesus died on the cross according, in accordance with prophecy. He died. He rose again just as he said he would, and again in accordance with Old Testament prophecy, so that we have hope. We can have confidence that he is who he says he is, that he can keep his word, and that he can save us from death as well. That kind of matters. And if God kept his word on the death and resurrection, we can trust him to keep his word that he's coming back just as he promised, just like we sang in the choir. I hope you weren't just listening to pretty music. I hope you were listening to the words to that song. Jesus Christ today, we're not here to praise a man who was loving and kind and died and stayed dead, we're celebrating the risen Savior. And all over the world, in every culture and every language, people are celebrating because God made a difference in this world. He's making a difference in the lives of people like you and I. Brothers and sisters, there's a tremendous song by Don Francisco. You, many of you heard before, some of you haven't. Uh, whether it's an old favorite or, or a new song for you, I just want you to, to, I want the team back there to crank it up, and uh, we'll, uh, We'll just uh, listen to this song and let it bless us this morning.
Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.